here's an American combo of the young rascals. So let's bring them on. Oh. Yeah. A lot of people talk about seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. For me, it was seeing Felix Cavallari, the Young Rascals, on the Ed Sullivan show playing something exactly like this. I mean, it was just like. Oh, this is what I wanted. That's that's the instrument I want to play. And One I, thing you need piano. to know about the Hammond organ like is that the people who play them are a passionate, even fanatic bunch. Whatever their musical style. Dennis Capica, for instance, has been playing since he was a kid. Today, he's the head of the Hammond Organ Company. Stan Spencer has been playing for 35 years. He has played in churches all across the country. Harvey Olson began servicing Hammond organs in 1961. Today, he can recite every name, date, and model number in Hammond organ history. Hammond organ history begins here, in Evanston, in the 1920s, in the workshop of an ambitious young inventor named Lawrence Hammond. But the organ was not Hammond's first or last invention. By the time he died, he had 110 patents. In 1922, for example, Hammond invented 3D movies. A few years later, he was the first to market an accurate electric clock. The Hammond Clock Company was a huge success. But by 1932, there were lots of electric clock manufacturers, and Hammond was losing money. He needed a new product. But a musical instrument was not a likely choice. He was the most non-musical person out there. He got into this whole thing primarily because he needed a gimmick to keep the company going after the bridge table ran out. Before the Hammond organ, there was the Hammond electric bridge table. Just load in a deck and the table automatically shuffles and deals your cards. Even with the Great Depression raging, Hammond sold 14,000 bridge tables in about two years. The problem was that when he got into 1933, he needed something different. And that's where the organ came in. Hammond found that the same synchronous motor that he used to keep accurate time could make a musical tone that never needed tuning. But Lawrence Hammond wasn't trying to make an organ. He just saw this as another gimmick that would make a few tones and, he hoped, a lot of money. One of his employees, who happened to be his accountant, was a church organist, a pipe organist. And he basically said, why don't we just build a complete organ? After two years of development, Hammond got the patent in 1934 and in 1935 unveiled a prototype of the Hammond Model A. It was such an immediate hit that he had 1,400 orders even before he went into production. And he began production in this building near Western and Diversity on the north side. Among the first to order were George Gershwin and Henry Ford. But most Hammond organs were going to churches. They marketed it as a substitute for a pipe organ. In reality, it, it really wasn't. But it certainly was close enough. And, and many, many churches bought it. The pipe organ manufacturers knew a threat when they saw one, and they complained to the Federal Trade Commission. Hammond's new instrument had no pipes, they said, and therefore should not be called an organ. 
So, in March of 1937, the Federal Trade Commission sponsored a showdown. A blind comparison between a $2,600 Hammond Model A and a $75,000 Skinner pipe organ. A panel of experts was assembled at Rockefeller Chapel at the University of Chicago, and they guessed wrong a third of the time. And so, the Hammond got to be called an organ. Sounding that close to a pipe organ requires the Hammond to produce an astonishing variety of tones. Inside the organ, it has something to do with what they call tone wheels, notched discs spinning near magnets. But for the Hammond player, the magic is in these draw bars. Somehow, the draw bars combine simple tones into richer sounds. And the best way to hear it is we'll pull these out one at a time and push just one note. So actually, when you push that note down, you've got these pulled out. You're actually playing a chord, but you don't notice it because it's actually just a harmonic thing. So when you pull them all out, you're playing every single sound you could possibly get out of the, all out of these nine drawbars. In the beginning, Hammond wasn't thinking about popular music. They were going after the pipe organ market. Churches, theaters, stadiums, broadcasters. Among the first to adopt it, radio soap operas. Yes, Ma is hoping against hope that she'll find that good in Stella, which she so firmly believes exists in everyone. But popular musicians did find their way to the Hammond organ. Within a few years, Fats Waller recorded jazz on a Hammond. Soon, so did Count Basie. That was super, Miss Smith. Now let's really get hot. Yeah, let's yeah. go below the border for some South American jive. Yeah. 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 Okay, kitties. <laughs> but the musician who may have done the most to bring the Hammond into popular music is now mostly forgotten. Her name was Ethel Smith a former hotel organist. When she appeared in this 1944 Red Skelton Esther Williams movie, Bathing Beauty, the song Tico Tico became an international hit. And Ethel Smith became the first lady of the Hammond organ. Soon, she and the Hammond were everywhere, and everyone, it seemed, wanted to play one. Well, it didn't take Lawrence Hammond long to notice this untapped home market, and in 1949, he came out with the first spinet organ. That same year, Hammond moved to 4200 West Diversity into an old Al Capone beer warehouse. Within six years, the spinet had outsold all previous models. And Hammond promotion was all about versatility. Any kind of music you want, anytime, anywhere. And the clouds are As the company moved beyond churches, it took off. By the mid-60s, Hammond had 3,000 employees and was considered a blue-chip stock. The Hammond organ owes part of its success, and its sound, to this big box sitting next to almost every Hammond organ. It's called a Leslie speaker. And don't ask an organist to play without one. A Hammond without a Leslie, to me, is like a ship without a sail. The Leslie isn't just a big speaker. On the inside, most speakers don't have moving parts. You flip a switch, and that would turn on those motors, and you got this great, big, beautiful, real vibrato. 
The Leslie speaker was invented in 1940, but not by Lawrence Hammond. In fact, Hammond did everything he could to drive the inventor, Don Leslie, out of business. Frivolous lawsuits, any anything, I guess we'd call it harassment. They harassed him as much as possible in the hopes that he would, uh, he would go under. For many years, the Hammond Company even forbade its dealers from selling Leslie speakers. It was arrogance. They didn't develop it, so they didn't want it. But they couldn't stop it. And ironically, the Leslie speaker only increased the Hammond organ's popularity. But then, in 1954, Hammond introduced its most famous and influential model, the B-3. And now to keep our holiday kettle boiling, here's that great recording combo starring the king of the organ, Jimmy Smith. And there was one musician who did the most to give the B-3 a permanent place in rock and jazz history. Jimmy Smith came along and he came up with a setting where he pulled these bottom three notes, the, these bottom three draw bars out, and occasionally he'd pull the fourth one out. He basically invented the concept of playing jazz organ. Jimmy Smith died in February of 2005. He never attained the kind of recognition outside of jazz circles that many say he deserved. But every jazz, rock, and R&B organist will say, it all goes back to Jimmy Smith. One of the first was Booker T. Jones. And Booker T. took Jimmy Smith and said, let's take this to R&B. Throughout the 60s and 70s, the Hammond B3 showed up more than many rock fans knew. Professional musicians may have loved the Hammond, but by the 1970s, the home market was losing ground to cheaper imports, and the company was laying off employees. In 1973, Lawrence Hammond died. In 1975, the company built its last B3, and by 1985, the Hammond Organ Company was bankrupt. But today, the company is back, still in the Chicago area, but now owned by Suzuki Music of Japan. In 2003, Hammond Suzuki released what it calls the new B3. It looks like a B3. In fact, the cabinet is a precise replica. And according to many of the top B3 players, it even sounds like the original. But the sounds are digital. These days, instead of trying to kill the Leslie speaker, Hammond is building them. Well, it's too soon to know whether or not the new B3 will ever sell as well as the original Hammond organs, but what is clear is that those original organs created by a musically talentless inventor from Evanston have had a major and lasting impact on American music.